Amen. So now, with all joy, we get to go into our Youth Sunday. Amen. How spontaneous was that? Amen. There was great rejoicing. Well, we have two. Uh, this is going to be the sparkly edition. We have two young ladies who are going to be sharing with us. And, um, and if they're nervous, that means they're doing it right. Amen. They're putting their heart into it. And our first participant is the young, the lovely Rachel Flores. Come on down, sister. Look at that smile. She is ready to share the word of God with you. And I'm ready to go back to my seat and take notes. Amen. Here we go. Let me get you the microphone. Here, gullies. Put your stuff there. Find a nice spot here. Maybe a, a clump of hair or something. There you go. Amen. God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, God is good. And all the time. Who is he blessed to be in the house of God? Amen. It's amazing. Firstly, I would like to thank Pastor Don and Sister Ran and Brother L.A. for allowing me to speak in front of you all. And I do apologize if I do stutter and stammer during this testimony. Um, for those of you who don't know me, hi, my name is Rachel. I grew up in this loving community and under the teachings of God. But before I start, I would like you to open, to open your Bible to 1 Peter 2 verse 2 which says, as newborn babies, desire pure milk of the word that you may grow. I was raised in front of the Lord, worshiping and praising and attending church, um, attending the church every Sunday. <clears throat> At the age of five, I started attending Sunday school and I would learn about, teaching, about the, uh, the teachings of God in various ways, such as um, word searches and crossword puzzles. I didn't have much friends back then. I was more of that lonely and quiet kid, but that did not stop me from showing up to Sunday classes, Sunday school classes. Um, I won't stay more in Sunday school because I didn't want to go, because I, I enjoyed it a lot and I didn't want to leave. But as I was going to youth, I was scared because I thought I wouldn't enjoy it much and I thought the elders would be scary. And of course they're old too. But yeah, um, but after a few months, I began opening my life to youth and God has changed me a lot because I, and once um, back then I was experiencing National Youth Camp for the first time, I really enjoyed it a lot. I became more closer with the youth um, people and it was kind of scary because there was a lot of people there and I was kind of close with my siblings because they're the ones who were taking care of me and um, helping me. But now that I'm 14, I really enjoy youth. I love listening to Pastor Don's preaching and I want to encourage the little kids who are in Sydney school to enjoy Pastor Don's preaching and I want to see them grow up and... Um, <laughs> sorry. I want to see them grow up and just praise and worship with the elders too. Um, I was living my best life until recently I had, troubling, I had trouble balancing my schoolwork and I was constantly lost focus on my relig religious studies. I felt that I was falling into the deep void and thought I could not find a way out. I also got distracted easily and would tend to forget to attend. The struggle got harder and harder, so I decided to stop and drop everything and prayed. I prayed for God to make a way out of this virtual cycle. And I would like to read out Matthew 7 verse 7. A friend of mine cherished this Bible verse, and I thought I would like to share it because it aligns with my story. It says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. And indeed, the Lord spared, he, spared me his sorrow sorrow and got me out of this cycle and once again i am living my best life i pray every day when i wake up before i eat and before i go to bed god works his wonders in so many ways and i am so proud to be a believer i also would like to read second timothy 3 verse 14 to 15. it says you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of 
knowing from whom you have learned them and from that childhood you have learned the Holy Scriptures in which you are able to make a wise salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Meaning, no matter how hard or tough life gets, do not, get up, do not give up. A famous quote I would like to add is, do your best and God will do the rest. God created us with love and to conquer the purposes and he has set us for a and he set us for. God is a miracle worker and creator, provider, savior, king of kings, and the alpha, of, um, alpha and the omega of the world. Before I end this speech, I would like to leave you a quote and says, faith is taking the first step, even when you don't see the whole staircase. Thank you. She was just, you know, amazed. She goes, oh, you know, I grew up in a DY area and we didn't have a church like this where the youth were so turned on to go to, you know? And so it just made me happy to know that we're doing things right and you're doing things right. Amen. I'm proud of our youth. We've got wonderful youth. They know how to pray. Amen. They know how to open the word and share it. And I'm looking forward to taking notes on this sermon as well. Amen. God bless you, sister. If you can find a little spot there to hook that up. Amen. Amen. This is Mika Lubaga. Amen. I didn't know what to do. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Oh, yeah. I'll do that in the microphone. Okay. Praise the Lord, church. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let me just open. Now I'm gone. Before I, I was starting to speak, I was in a panic of not having signal in here. And I didn't make my um, Word document as uh, available offline. So thank you for LA for giving me that signal as well. <laughs> um, so before I start, I just want to thank Pastor Don and the youth leaders for um, giving me this opportunity to speak to you guys again. And also I want to give God the glory and for giving me this um, word to share to you guys. And I hope that you guys get something out of this sermon that I'm going to share to you guys. And if you have your Bible, let's open it to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 to 4. Say amen if you're there. So 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 to 4. So 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 to 4. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforted us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. So many people in this life want everything without any effort. We see that doctor's home and we say, I'd sure like to have a home like that. But we don't want to go to the school for 15 years so we can get, so we can make that kind of money so we can buy a home like that. And we see that young man walking through the mall it looks like his muscles are about to bust out of his shirt. And we say, man, I'd like to have that muscles like that. You can have that muscles if you go to the gym five times a week and pump iron till it feels like your arms and legs are going to fall off. Or we see that pastor of a large church, his prosperous drives a nice car and leaves a beautiful home and we say i want a church like that a car like that and a beautiful home like that the question is are you willing to do what he did to get it 
Are you willing to be faithful over a handful of not so perfect people? Seek God, study his word, obey him when it doesn't make sense. Be persecuted and publicly criticized and humiliated. You see, many believers have the attitude that just because they are saved and in the family of God, that now God is supposed to give them everything they ever dreamed of without any effort or work or discipline on their part. The fact is, it costs what it costs, and it never goes on sale. Yes, God, yes, God wants to prosper you, bless you, but sometimes you have, you're going to have to go through something. Sometimes you have to struggle. Sometimes you have to fight. There is something in the struggle that is necessary to becoming what God has ordained us to be. God left giants in the promised land on purpose. First, it's because they needed to learn how to fight. The second, because giants distinguish the difference between professors and possessors. It's one thing to, conf- to confess the promise of God. It's another thing to strap on your sword and go to toe to toe with your giants and possess your promises. Amen. Number three, giants expose the grasshoppers in the crowd. When giants show up, grasshoppers speak up. Grasshoppers usually blend into their environment, but giants uncover them. Remember that grasshoppers don't eat grapes. You will never have promised land faith with a grasshopper mentality. Number four, you get to know yourself in the struggle. The real you comes out under pressure. Do you realize when you're under pressure, you feel like you're not yourself? But in, in the process of being under pressure, you find out that you can do it. That even if you're in that struggle, you're under pressure, you can do it. And number five, you get to know your God. You realize that God is your only hope. That God is your only help, church. Number six, you get stronger. You put down roots. You dig into the word and prayer. You become aware of the excess and unnecessary things in your life. Number eight, I skipped number seven, guys. I'm sorry about that. But seven is you become aware of the excess and unnecessary things in your life. Number eight, the struggle produces thankfulness. Example, someone survives a tornado. Their house is gone, their car is gone, but they're so thankful that they're still alive. The family is still together. I was, um, another example is when I was um, scrolling Facebook, I saw this stranger. I don't know this person, but it was um, shared by one of my friends. And the story was that this family went for a holiday. And instead of 20 hours of flight, they ended up having 35 hours of flight. And when they arrived to the country's airport, nine of their luggages was missing. But then the the father was calling the um, managers, the staff in there, what's happening, where are luggages? They were the only one left in that baggage, what do you call that? Luggage counter, like you claim where you get your luggages. And then a few weeks, so to cut it short, a few weeks later, all their luggages came back except for one. So eight of them came back to them. And nine, uh, the other one didn't came, didn't arrive to their place. And that one luggage has all the expensive things like the bags, the things that they need to 
um, give to their relatives, to their family. But what he was thankful is that his family was there. He, they were fine. They were all together enjoying the holiday. And he was being thankful to God that in despite of all the things that happened in the airport, he was being thankful, church. Amen? Amen. And when you know you had to fight for what you got, you appreciate it more. And that guy was very appreciative because he didn't care about the luggages. He cared about his family being fine, being together, enjoying the holiday. And you want, and the second one, you won't let anyone take it from you. The nine, number nine, struggles test your level of commitment. The only way to truly understand your level of commitment is through the struggle. And number 10, the struggle qualifies you for rest. In Matthew eleven twenty-eight, 28, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. In Hebrews four eleven, Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Number 11. The struggle qualifies you for a reward. David heard them speak of a reward, but he knew the reward was only for the person who would fight and kill Goliath. In 1 Samuel 17:25, And the men of Israel said, have you seen this man that is come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up. And it shall be that the man who killed him, the king will enrich him with the great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. We should understand that many times the struggle, the fight, the warfare, the praying, the waiting patiently, the enduring is as important as the blessing or reward. Amen, that's right. While we are looking at the reward, God is looking at the development that is taking place through the struggle. Faith is forged in the furnace of adversity. The first generation, first generation children of Israel forfeited their inheritance because they would not fight. How many of God's people have forfeited their destiny, their promises, just because they refused to fight? When the heat was on, they bailed out, backed down, laid down their swords, and conceded to the enemy. As long as everything was going smooth, they were right there shouting with the rest of the army. But when the struggle came, they caved in and gave in to the discouragement, fear, and doubt. If you will be truthful to yourself today, church, what has made you what you are in God is the struggle. What you had to fight for, what you had to fight against, what you had to overcome. The caterpillar goes through a process of metaphor metamorphosis through which, it, through which it changes from an earthbound crawly worm into a beautiful butterfly. But this process involves struggle. To cut the struggle short would rob the butterfly of its destiny. The baby chick and the eggs go through a process of growth inside of the egg until it begins to outgrow the egg, but it must peck its way out of the egg. This struggles, this struggle strengthens the baby chick and prepares it for life outside the egg. And to cut the struggle short would severely endure if not kill the chick. 
Through the struggle, it gains the strength it needs to survive and thrive in its new environment. And here is one of the best thing about your struggle, church. It qualifies you to help others. When you've been through something, you can help somebody else. When you've stood your ground and fought your battles and conquered your giants, you are qualified to help someone else through their battles. One thing that has really helped me through my struggle is the thought of how many people am I going to be able to help and encourage as a result of going through this. The devil wants to make it all about you. Give you tunnel vision. He wants you to focus all your attention on the struggle. But God wants you to realize that even though the devil sent you to take you out, God is going to use you. Use it to take you up. And when you get up, you will be able to help somebody else to get up. In my main scripture in 2 Corinthians 1, 3 to 4, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforted us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by, by the comfort wherewith, with, wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Amen. Through your struggles, God is bringing you to a place of greater influence and blessings to your brothers and sisters in the Lord. Yes, I may be going through a struggle we may be going to a struggle, but I'm growing, I'm growing through my struggle. I'm developing some spiritual muscles. I'm developing some compassion, some patience, some endurance, some long suffering. I'm developing the ability to put myself in the position where others are and to feel what they feel. So I can speak a word in season to them. Amen. Yes, I may be struggling right now. You may be struggling right now. But don't feel sorry for me or for yourself. There's something in the struggle that you need to become what God has ordained you. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Pray for me. Pray for yourself. Pray for your brothers and sisters. Not to get out, but to go through. God did not deliver Daniel from the lion's den. He delivered him through it. God did not deliver the three Hebrew children from the fiery furnace. He delivered them through it. David needed Goliath. The children of Israel needed the giants. The Hebrew, the three Hebrew children needed the fiery furnace. Samson needed the Philistines. 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 And we need the struggle. There is no testimony without a test, church. And there is no victory without a battle. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. I don't know what battle you are facing right now. I don't know what enemy might be raised up against you right now. And I don't know what the devil is trying to do in your life today, church. And I don't know what mountain is standing in your way. But I came to tell you today that no matter who you are or what you're facing, the answer is the same. 
and that is faith. I know it may, it may not make sense, but from God's perspective, victory is not determined by the outcome. It is established by the income. In other words, it is established by faith, and faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Amen. Hallelujah. That's right. A victorious life is not a problem free life. It is a life in which we overcome our enemies by virtue of struggle and fight. Finally, let me say this, church. The struggle don't last forever. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. The struggle is an instrument of transition. The struggle means you are on your way somewhere. The devil wouldn't fight you if you were not going somewhere. The struggle prepare, prepares you for your future. The struggle is an indication of transition. Don't feel sorry for yourself, church. Don't feel sorry for me. I'm just in a transition. We are all in transition. And you, and you can know you have won the fight before you ever step into the ring. Victory is not external. Victory is internal. Victory demands determination. Victory is not one-time experience. Victory is a way of life. It is a spirit life that is born, that is born in us. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Amen. Victory is the spirit of perseverance. Victory is the spirit that stands at the door and continues to knock even though the answer is no. And victory is the spirit that hears the criticism but keeps on pre pressing. Victory is not a life without problems. Victory is a life that faces problems with a promise, church. Amen. For every problem, there is a promise. And victory is the faith that clings to the promise Amen. until the problem is defeated. And victory is not in never going through a trial. Victory is in how you go through the trial. This is how victory goes through a trial. It, victory goes through a trial knowing that it is working for you, church. And I want to end in this scripture. In Psalms 23, 4. David says, Yet though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy God, thy rod, thy staff, they comfort me. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. So that was Mika and Rachel this morning. Amen. Amen. Why don't we stand and we'll have Brother Boy come to the keyboards. Amen. Beautiful encouragement there. Now, it might be a, a bit of encouragement for the past to remember that your struggles have made you what you are so far. But let it be an encouragement for your future as well. Struggles are going to keep coming. And, and don't do what Christians normally do, where we pray God to take away the struggle. Amen. But pray God will help you to rise up and ta tackle the struggle. Amen. Because that's where you become different. You become stronger in Jesus. And you can face the next 10 struggles. But if you ask God to take away the struggle, that just means you're going to remain weak for the next one. Amen. And God may have some mystery in mind for you. Amen. So... Again, like James says, count it all joy when divers temptations come your way. 
I mean, it doesn't make sense at first, but if we can learn to adopt that attitude and not panic when struggles come and when challenges come, amen, then we can actually just walk right into the valley of the shadow of the Lord, right. the shadow of death with the Lord, holding our hand and strengthening us. God will be your wisdom. God will be your strength, but he needs a vessel. Amen. And you can become that vessel, that very shiny, well-experienced vessel. Amen. Able to bless others. Let's pray and let's talk to God.